Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. You are in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I'm David. And today we are speaking with a guest who's going to talk us talk to us about associations. So everyone will remember as childhood uh, when you were kids that your parents were like, you are who you associate with. And John is going to talk about a real life experience that he had. Uh, I'll let you. I'll let him go into more detail about it. But it was. I mean, this story is just so incredible of how you you may be minding your business, doing your regular job day to day, and you get implicated in something that is way bigger than you can ever imagine. So I'd like to welcome our podcast guest today, John Smith. He is the author of. Embracing the Abyss. Welcome to the podcast, John. Yes, thank you. Glad to be here. So before I start, your name is John Smith. Is that your name or are you in the Witness Protection Program? <laughs> no, I, I had a choice when I uh, was going to pin the author's name to my book. And of course, I have a middle name and I have a middle initial. But I thought, you know, why not just make it John Smith? Uh, People may think in terms of an everyday guy, John Smith, uh, kind of like some of the uh, the old movies um, that uh, um, people thought that it was it was just a, a, a basic name, and that's what I thought. And I thought that if people were asking me about something, I'd say, you know, there's a lot of John Smiths out there. Out there. Okay. So that's, that's and- why I chose. Oh, no worries, no worries at all. And and when I started the podcast, people, we can always remember back when we were kids, and um, I'm a big fan of Leave it to Beaver. So when Eddie Haskell comes around, you know, there's an association of, oh, you're hanging out with the bad kids in the crowd or what have you. And if Eddie gets in trouble, then you're like, I didn't do anything. Or Wally would say, I didn't do anything. And they would say, well, you were with Eddie, so just by association, you're guilty by association. And I'd like for you to talk about uh, what was the impetus of writing Embracing the Abyss. Well, it, um, it kind of it rattled around in my head for 30 years. And I'd tried a few times to uh, put together all the pieces of, of notes that I had taken over time that thrown into a, a large box. And it just got to a point to where I, I, needed, to get it, I needed to get it out of me. You know, it was uh, something that I had wanted to do for a long time, uh, and I so I pursued it. I found a um, found myself a, uh, a publishing team that I hired. I self published the book, and it was more more of just getting it off my chest. I guess it's a good way to put it. Absolutely, it was. It, it seems like it the the period has passed. Like you said, over 30 years. So I'm just trying to imagine you try to go on with your life, but there's this nagging feeling in your quiet moments, either when you're by yourself or if you're right before you go to sleep or if you wake up in the middle of the night. It's you're, it's something that your soul is kind of tapping you on your shoulder, saying, "This is a story that needs to be told." Exactly, exactly. And uh, more and more, I was able to, I guess, realize that I really did need to get it out, that it would be good for me to get it out and uh, allow other things to come into my life and also a viewpoint of life. Uh, I, I certainly didn't expect, though, the, the outcome, but it did, and that's what my book is about, is the, uh, the presidential pardon. Sure, and we just passed uh, Veterans Day, so I realized in your bio that you – are a veteran, so thank you for your service. And well, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, of course, I was in Nam, so all I want to hear, or I'd rather hear, is uh, welcome home. Yeah, <laughs> welcome home. <laughs> welcome home for sure. And uh, David and I, we talk a lot with a lot of our guests about awakening moments or your hello moment, as we were taught. In that, you we traditionally have a a, a linear life, or it feels that way. And then there's this huge disruption that you are not planning on, and it puts your life in a totally different tangent, which brings us to today, 
do you would that happen when you when you said welcome home from Vietnam? Did you think okay the the hardest part is over and now it's easy breezy? Well, I was I was surprised at the uh, I'll call it treatment I received. Mm-hmm. Uh, there wasn't anybody saying welcome home. Thanks for thanks for what you did. Uh, it was uh, something that I, I, I really didn't because I guess. I should say that being in the Army and being in Vietnam, you didn't hear much about, you know, they wanted to keep that news away from you. They didn't want the, the troops to hear about how there were riots in the streets and, and uh, four dead in Ohio. Um, we were just unaware of any of that. So when I, when I came back, I was just, I don't know, I was in a, somewhat of a state of shock. Wow. So with you saying that, that could have been the impetus for embracing the abyss or we haven't even talked about savings and loans. So I think there are multiple entries that was setting you up to embrace the abyss. Absolutely. Uh, I, uh, I, in my, in my book, I refer to the abyss as um, it's just basically it's part of your soul. It's, it's, it could be your conscience and, other things mixed with it involved. Uh, I, I took it from Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, who basically said, when a man looks into the abyss, uh, he looks, he's looking at his conscience. Um, I remembered the scene in the um, movie Wall Street, the original one, and the, the, the guy, who was it, Charlie Sheen, there was a scene where he was running down the hall and how, didn't know that the feds were in the back getting ready to bust him. And Hal Holbrook stopped him, put his hand on his shoulder and said, if you remember anything, remember this. When a man looks into the abyss and nothing looks back at him, that's when a man finds his conscience. And I, I, took, the, I took the abyss from that and I talked to people about how I should name the book and they I had one person tell me, oh, you want, you want to talk about or, or write about avoiding the abyss. And within a microsecond, I said, no way. You know, this is something I put my arms around. So, and I put my arms around me, so it's embracing the abyss. And that's how it, that's how it evolved as, as the title of my book. Nice. Uh, but I think the difference with you referencing Wall Street with Charlie Sheen is that he was, in this case, doing something uh, that was was not above board. And right. you, after finishing Vietnam, you had gone to your traditional education, became an accountant, and you were working with a firm. So let's just talk about how it was as a accountant. Well, I was a uh, CPA. I had been the uh, controller of the construction company that uh, – kind of morphed into uh, the SNL. I was the chief financial officer of the holding company that bought the SNL. But I, I was unaware of the activities that the chairman and the CEO uh, were, were concocting. And, of course, I was the guy that was involved with compliance and administrative matters. And they didn't want me to know what was going on because, again, I was the guy that had to sit down with the auditors and look them in the eye uh, about nothing was going on here. And, of course, I didn't know anything was going on there. Actually, I left. Uh, I decided on my birthday to leave the company. And in that uh, departure, I, I discovered that I figured that should you know, I discovered a box on my front porch six months later, and it was a large box and it was full of documents that uh, said I was being sued by the FSLIC for five hundred and forty million dollars charged with uh, fraud, conspiracy, uh, racketeering, I mean you name it, they listed it. 
there's something interesting about birthdays. Um, with birthdays, be it you know yearly, or at the five or ten year mark, we usually say five or zeros is when you kind of sit back and you embrace, like you were saying, and you determine, hey, do I like the way life is going? Let's continue, or I should make some changes. And it's often said that people transition close to their birthday as well because they make that ultimate decision um, along those lines. Uh, are you familiar with that line of thinking? Well, it, it, you know, the way I see things is that when you reach those turning points, like a, like you say a 40 or a 50 or a 60, that type of thing, that you, you reassess, you kind of, kind of way in terms of in your own mind where you are, where you thought you'd be, where you want to be. And um, so it's, I, I view it as the framing if that's what you're, if that's what you're describing. A- absolutely. Yeah, and, and it's really interesting because you're in Texas and you were working with a company in Texas and you were talking about savings and loan, which is the 80s. And then in the 90s, you had Enron, which I believe was also in Texas. So yes. would you say that there's a hotbed? <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I'm just bringing levity to the conversation. No, that's you know I would I would say that uh, you know if if uh, I used to to talk about in my speeches how if you took you know, I was with a company called Vernon Savings and Loan, and if you took the letters of Enron, you would find them in the in the name Vernon. <laughs> <laughs> that was that, that was my own letter play or word play, uh, and sure enough, but the but the act, the mindset and the activities that occurred in both places by certain people were were you know they were the, almost exactly the same. It was, and it, and of course the both came down the uh, uh, the S and L had a huge effect on um, I guess reputations. Banking itself, uh, Enron, of course, uh, I believe, put one of the large uh, national CPA firms out of business. I think it was Arthur Anderson. Yes. Uh, and um, so there was, uh, you know, there was a just here. It was like here, here we go again. You know, um, it's the the shock about how something like that could occur, and uh, it was, you know, I I found it. Uh, disgusting for what had happened uh, with Enron and then didn't really argue with people about what I did. I just kind of kept it to myself. I didn't uh, get involved with what I did or didn't do. And, um, and as time, as time went on, it would, it, it haunted me, I guess I'll say, and uh, certain events occurred that I, you know, I wish I wouldn't. This guy named John Smith. Mm-hmm. And let me ask you, because as, as an outsider looking in, and as an outsider that watches the news, when these type of things happen, we always look for a fall guy, and we look for the money guy. So in this case, it would be the 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 controller, the CPA, the accountant. They should know they're looking at the books every day. You hear cooking the books and what have you. So it's kind of easy to pinpoint someone such as yourself with your with your expertise. If you could talk a little bit about how you were going about your business and how they kept you from that vital information. Well, let's see. The first thing, I guess, that, that comes to mind with respect to that is there were there were more than one or two occasions that I would happen to be in the uh, the big time suite. I was I was an executive officer, but I wasn't one of the big time executive officers. And the CEO and the chairman would be in a room. Chairman always at the desk. The CEO guy leaning over the desk, uh, drawing, writing something sort of that. And I would walk in. And as I would walk in, you know, they was, they stopped, and that happened more than once. And of course, I didn't think 
<laughs> well, the, what I thought was, and I always thought this after I left, well, you know, was it something I said? Was it something I did? So I, I, was, I was basically blaming it on me, uh, having done something that they didn't want me in there. And I never once thought that they were going to be, you know, crooks, but that's how it turned out. Now, was it the case, I'm just trying to think of a, a timeline here where you, you were coming up on your birthday and you were reevaluating things and there was something that just wasn't sitting right. So it may have been your higher self just telling you, hey, this isn't where you need to be. And they may have looked at it as, well, if he's gone, it's easier to blame this person that really couldn't defend themselves. Well, no, not exactly. When, when I left uh, in September, that was probably three, at least three months after the CEO and the president, the, CEO, the chairman, and other, the other higher executives, all of them had been removed that the Federal Home Loan Bank Board had, came, had come in and just, they were gone. And when they, whenever all these people left, I was like, through attrition, I guess, if that's the right word, uh, ended up being the most ranking officer. And, and all of a sudden, I, just, I was called the chief operating officer. And I spent probably two months out of those three months been bombarded with questions and, and, and from people that had been made promises to by the former executives that, that were no longer there. And they were, were, were saying to me that I was promised this and I want it delivered. And you know, I, like, all I could say was I don't have any wherewithal. The bank doesn't, the SNL doesn't have any wherewithal to do that. But what they were looking at were unfulfilled promises that were made by the CEO and the chairman. John, let me ask you this. When something like this happens, does the, you know, the CEO and the chairman do they go into it, this is what we're going to do, or is it something kind of that just starts and then it starts to snowball and gets kind of out of, out of control, kind of like Ponzi schemes where they, you know, something you start doing, but you don't realize that it's going to escalate to, to the point to where it does. So was that, their, was that their plan, their intention from the very beginning to, to do that, or is it just something that just kind of gets out of control and it gets just beyond their you know, their grasp? Well, um, I got a couple of thoughts on that. Uh, they had a management style uh, that was not, there was not any, any, any one person above you that, you, you that was responsible for you. Uh, they kind of spread out all of the pieces of what they were doing, and, and so one person didn't know all the pieces of the fraud that they were creating. For instance, they would have guy A or guy B or guy C involved in that particular deal that was going on, but none of them knew what the other one was doing or what they'd been charged with. So the information about what was happening was, was basically fragmented. It was scattered. Mm. Uh, so that, that, that style of management allowed them to to kind of, you know, do what they wanted to do with lots of smoke. And they used to say lots of smoke and mirrors uh, because the people that were told what to do, they didn't know what these other people were doing in the same thing. <clears throat> so that was, uh, I think, their management style uh, helped them accomplish what they did. But for them and themselves, the way that you put it, it, came, it got out of control the, I don't think they ever believed that they would have their empire created come crashing down on them at such a rapid pace, uh, and it did. And they found themselves in a, in a situation where they had no place to run. They had no place to go. 
the president was a guy who, CEO, was a guy who was you know, real smart, uh, bright guy. Everybody liked him real well. And he always figured that he'd be able to um, outsmart or not be taken to the, to the you know, outside by the uh, chairman. And that was wrong. Um, because it just all it was over it was too much overwhelming for them. They had too many people clamming on the door, making making noise about where are the promises that we were supposed to be provided for us doing this loan and our doing this loan. You pulled a bunch of money out of the loan for yourself to buy jets, vacations, things like that. Yeah, I think that's my next question, John, with regards to human nature. In that when you were seeing this, a lot of smoke and mirrors, no one really pays attention when everything is a fine old machine, if everything's going great. And we see this with, with your story, like you said, with Enron, uh, with the housing bubble that burst in the early 2000s. When it's on the upward trajectory, no one's really questioning it. And then if there's a hiccup, then we start to unveil that that's going to happen. And I'm bringing it up because you, you've seen this over the last couple of decades, and it hasn't happened yet. So is this something where, fortunately or unfortunately, it's part of the business cycle where things get really good and then that human greed factors in? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, I think we're, we're already seeing signs of the unwinding mm-hmm. of the QE quantum, um, quantitative um, easing that occurred under Bernac. Mm -hmm. Um, So much money was was put in for purposes of uh, liquidity. And and now now we're seeing that unwind. And it's being unwound now. It's something like $80 billion a month. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing the effects of that. Uh, and we're going to see more of that. And then as we think about that, you know, nobody thinks enough about the, the national debt anymore. You know, that's, that's going to come home to roost someday. And, you know, we live in the, in the United States. We, we believe in the U.S. and we want to have happy lives. But it's like the, I'm, I, I'm thinking someday something like the banks in Cyprus – endured what was it last year or two when all of a sudden oh, yeah. these people's mm-hmm. bank accounts were gone and why were they mm-hmm. gone to, to pay the debt so this this is something that for me is kind of scary and my my kids and grandkids scary i guess the other side of that question is uh, when you when you keep pushing it back you, you you may think at least here in the states that well that's tomorrow's issue. We'll, we'll save that for tomorrow, meaning that's the next generation's issue. We won't have to deal with it. And so do you feel that that also comes into play where we, we can't run anymore because the debt is so high? That's right. You know, there's no place to hide. I mean, that's what was that mm-hmm. Ali used to say, you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's what we're finding. Uh, the, um, uh, it's 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 like it's ticking. It's like a time you know. It's like a time bomb, and in one way or another, it's going to go off. And we need to start facing it. But you know, if you look back where the debt was at a certain point, and I think you could probably pick a point sometime between Bush and Obama as, as their mm-hmm. presidencies. Mm-hmm. That Bush was somewhere around, I think. Uh, eight or nine billion or trillion rather. And when Obama left office, it was at, you know, 18 trillion. I think the guy, he doubled it. Uh, I I don't see at this point where we can say that Trump is actually working on that. But I believe that when, after this first year, that the tax and the tax incentives he introduced are, and people have more money to spend, it's also going to produce more money for the, uh, for the for the coffers of the of, of the IRS, and that's where money comes from to offset that debt. So, how much of that is going to be uh, effective in reducing the debt? We don't know yet. Yeah, that's a good point. 
uh, I want to go back for a second. So I was watching uh, a popular artist, to, you know, today, I guess Young Whippersnapper or what have you, but it was really interesting. To He's been around for about a year and a half. And when he first did an interview, a, you know, a, a national interview, nationally televised radio station, you know, he felt some way, let's just say, uh, he, no one could stop him, that type of deal. So fast forward until two days ago when this interview happened, he, had, he was supposed to be on this world tour. He canceled the tour because he realized that the people that were you know, around him were pillaging money from him, I mean, immensely. And you hear this a lot in the music industry. I guess you hear it a lot in a lot of industries. And the, the beautiful thing, the takeaway that I got from it was I'm glad he caught it now where he could have, he could have gone to jail for some of the fraud that the people around him were conducting. And in your case, we usually hear, oh, we got the bad guy and he went to jail and then we go on to the next news cycle. How are you, you, you had gotten a federal pardon. So did you do that on your own volition or you actually got outside help? Uh, you know, I, and this is, this is part of my book, of course, that I, I was, you know, in order for, for me to avoid going to prison back when the, the task force, the federal task force came to Dallas, uh, they didn't care if you were an officer or a secretary or a bill clerk. They figured everybody was involved and everybody was guilty. And, you know, I separated myself from that with my attorney. I had to get an attorney to defend myself. And in, in that process, it, it became, oh, boy, um, he spent most of his time beating on me, trying to get me to realize that I was on my way to prison. And I had this thing in my head of, no, I'm not. I'm right. I didn't do anything wrong. He says, it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter at all. You're on your way to prison. And he convinced me, though, that to avoid my hope, to avoid prison was to cross the Rubicon and become a member of the other camp. And to do that, I would have to plead guilty, and I would have to uh, help them in their investigations uh, without any, um, any leniency being involved. So... I became a government witness. The, I was. I had to be. I had to have integrity and, and uh, trust in order to be a government witness. And I was a government witness for 14 years. And in the 15th year, the FBI agent that prosecuted my case called me on the phone and said, "Hey, how about lunch?" So I met him and we had iced tea. And he said, um, I'm, "I want you to know that I've been in touch with." Uh, uh, the Justice Department attorneys and the FBI agents that prosecuted your case and the other cases at Vernon Savings. And we want you to know that we're all in agreement that we should never have prosecuted you. Wow. It's interesting. Said, that, yeah. Yeah, it was just interesting that you said, you know, after the 14 years you had tea with the person Whereas when it initially happened, you probably were thinking sugar, honey, iced tea. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, uh, yeah, he said, we don't know much about pardons, but, you know, we'll support you if we can. And then later on, I learned that I had saved the government thousands of hours and millions of dollars. And I hand wrote typed my my pardon request I didn't consult a lawyer I didn't use a lawyer because this was something I had to do myself and I did and uh, sent it off with my fingers crossed and and after every Thanksgiving I would I would call my pardon attorney who was assigned to me uh, or I guess I was assigned to her her name was Hope and uh, I'd call her after every Thanksgiving, and I would say, you know, I was watching on TV. I saw President Bush uh, pardoning another turkey. And she said, Mr. Smith, I can't tell you anything about your application. 
And I said, I know, I know. I'm just checking to see if it's in the trash or not. <laughs> and uh, five, years, five years passed, and the phone rang, and it was Hope. And she said, uh, without due haste, she said, Mr. Smith, I want you to know that President Bush has granted you a pardon and wishes you Merry Christmas. And it was just like that. Wow. So, so while all this was happening, you had to embrace the abyss. Like, what all did that entail? Did your uh, did your marriage stay intact? The children? Like, what all happened to your day to day life while you were in the abyss? Um, you know, that was one of the things that my attorney would yell at me. He said, "If you continue thinking that you're not going to go to jail, and you want to challenge them, you know, the government's going to run over you with their big truck and their train and back up and then do it again." And and he said, "If you want to continue, you, you have to think about the risk you're taking." Which the other guys, the other six uh, executives that were involved, they thought that they, you know, they'd be okay and. No problem, but I was, he said to me, you're going to lose your house, you're going to lose your, your investments, you're going to lose your bank accounts, probably your home, and maybe even your marriage. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I, kept them, I kept them all, um, except, <laughs> except for all the money in the bank. <laughs> that went to the lawyers. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, it became something that, that I was warned about, uh, but I would say for my own, I, I fared fairly well. Now, it was the stigma that follows, though. It was the stigma. Mm-hmm. Um, when we were living in uh, Summit County, Colorado, I, I, was, um, I was on the uh, county housing authority board. I was on the school board. You know, I was an upright citizen, and then one day... I open up the newspaper. Well, I open up the newspaper, and that was front page news. Mm-hmm. School board member agrees to felony count, mm-hmm. and you know I, I was up, upcoming. I was upfront about it, but still, I crawled under a rock. We moved away from there because the stigma was stuck to you, no matter what you did, and mm-hmm. the, and the and the pardon erased that. Or at least neutralized it so that if that had come up, if I'd had the pardon then, I'd say, hey, guys, I got a presidential pardon. But that would have kind of made the, uh, had the, I guess, smoothed it out of sorts. But it was certainly, the stigma was, was difficult to deal with. You said two really important things. I mean, you said a lot of important things, but two things that really stood out with what you just said was that if what I do day to day I may be good at that because I do that day to day, but I really need to seek out expertise in things I don't know about, right? And then the other part was in, in cases like this, if it's a large corporation, they have their own legal counsel. And so they'll say, well, you just use our legal counsel, they'll steer you in the right direction where there may be more self-interest and you get to short another stick. Exactly. And my response to that is, is not you know, they're, they're out for themselves, and they're the ones that hire the lawyers, and the lawyers are the ones that know who they, who they get paid by. The other executives, they all had to individually get their own lawyer. Mm-hmm. Did any of these, like the CEO and the chairman, did they end up doing any prison time? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, most everybody did. Uh, there was only one guy that didn't, uh, and that was just a per- personal issue. Uh, I think one one guy, the CEO, was initially given the largest uh, sentence of I think 30 years. Wow! And then and then he challenged that, and I think he served uh, five five years, six years, and the chairman served the same amount of time, five to six years, and the others served anywhere from a year to two years or I think six months to two years in prison. So my, uh, my attorney, he, he, the guy saved me, absolutely saved me. He saved me from the feds. So after something like this is part of, uh, you know, 
is, was part of it that you can't, and not necessarily you, but like maybe like the CEO and the chairman and those, those above you, that they can't be involved in any kind of SNL business or in the financial sector at all? Or Yeah, the top, top two guys were banned. Um, I don't think that any of the others wanted to pursue that. You know, I, 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 I felt uncomfortable about going to, trying to go get a job somewhere because they were going to ask me if you ever had any felony convictions, and the answer was yes. Yeah. This, of course, was before my pardon. So I became self-employed. I became an entrepreneur. Uh, and it was something I'm glad I did uh, because it, it, it helped me uh, avoid more stigma, I guess is a good way to put it. Yeah. What do you think the difference is? I mean, you we can't gloss over the fact that you said you had looked in the front page of the paper. So <laughs> this was before yeah. technology where we're on a 24-7 news cycle. And so, right. Right, and so the news just passes quicker, and people make decisions, snap decisions, without getting all of the facts. So when you said you had to leave your community that you were a part of, and you felt like a pariah. Is there anything you would do differently? No, I don't think I would, because when when I received my pardon, I it it allowed me to look back to look back at everything, and you know I've I've tried to sum it up. But that's certainly easier said than done. But I viewed it from a standpoint, was it because that I survived, that I persevered, that I was a victim, or that I was just screwed? And then I thought in terms of more and more as time had gone by, I realized that I, I believe now I realized that I was just selected to go through what I had done, what I'd been through. And that's also the premise for, for writing the book, my first book, Embracing the Abyss, for writing the book. Mm-hmm. That, that was the motivation for me to do that. And so I, was, I, was, I view it as, a, you know, I don't know why, but you know, I was selected. That is actually a really good segue uh, offline. We were talking, you and I were talking about uh, in our brief interchange about your attorney. You felt that you had a divine agreement to go through these situations in this current life. I'd like for you to talk a little bit about that. Well, um, his, his name was Steve Boucher. He was an extremely bright person, intelligent, tremendous communicator. He had a great reputation in Dallas. Um, he, um, but he, he, he turned. He actually turned away from, from that aspect of the law because in those days, fighting for clients and fighting against the other lawyers, it was pretty high, pretty high. Uh, pretty high on the charts for everybody there. So he ended up for himself. He was actually the creator of mediation in Texas. Mm. And he invented that, I'll say, to the the point that he had, he recruited people, mass, mass, uh, face to face with with others. And and so he introduced mediation so that the lawyers wouldn't uh, wouldn't involve themselves anymore. He had uh, in a previous life, Steve had been a, a cruel judge and a very cruel judge. Um, and the way he was to uh, create a karmic event or find a karmic event that was going to allow him to uh, to correct that behavior was me. So him saving me from the feds was his was the right for all those wrongs that he did in ancient ancient Rome. Mm. 
Uh, and yes, we did have a pact, and we still have a pact. It's still it's ongoing today. And I believe I've recently discovered what that what my end might be because I know what he his part was. <laughs> his part was to save me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but with, with with the writing of embracing the abyss, it's uh, it's helped me to formulate or at least you know, I, I've been told it's a, it's a conversational read. It's only 200 pages, and when people read it, you know the reviews that I have had uh, were, were those that that something changed in them. They felt so, they felt different. They felt that there was a transformation going on. So I began thinking of how I could, you know, do that again, you know, recreate that again, embracing the abyss. And what I've come up with is something like the, um, you know, Jack Canfield as an author. He's the guy that did the chicken, chicken, of, chicken soup for the soul. Yeah. And uh, I was in a seminar the other day. And I started thinking, and boom, it hit me. And I thought, you know, if people felt change come from what, in this, this particular book, then why shouldn't there be more change that they can involve themselves with? If I were to create, because the purpose of embracing the abyss in the book was that the abyss is part of your soul. It's part of your conscience. It's, it is your conscience. It's, it's something that, you know, you, you deal with all the time, but you don't realize it. And I felt like that if I could take that same ch- change and transformation that people felt and apply that to, say, certain groups or certain people through, a, through another book, then I will. And I'm gonna, it'll be called Embracing Your Abyss for the Unloved, Embracing Your Abyss for the Challenged, Embracing your abyss for lots of things that it can apply to that people would look at and say, this is for me. I want change. And therefore, it'll, it, it needs to be a smaller book. It's not going to be a 300-page book every time. But I think that there's a lot, of, a lot of opportunity to do that. And this only came to me in the last 72 hours. I will add for, uh, from a marketing standpoint, that Jack was really Jack Canfield was really good at uh, niching down his book. So it started out with Chicken Soup for the Soul, but then it had grown to Chicken Soup for the golf player or Chicken Soup for the teenager. So yeah. where the regular person may not read Chicken Soup for the Soul, it'll speak to them if I'm a golfer or a teenager in this aspect. So if you right. do something like that, it, it may be a series. Well, I'm hoping so because I I view it for the people that that you know have been uh, accused, um, wronged, mistreated, challenged, blamed. You know, there's a lot of people that they're going to have a lot of they're going to identify with that kind of a situation, and I think my talking about that is going to help. You know, Jack took his, his concept, and he, I think he had, has 238 different books. <laughs> and, he's, yeah. and, he's sold, and he's now sold half a billion copies of yeah. chicken, chicken soup. It's yeah. just amazing. Just amazing. He's an amazing guy. He was the guy Absolutely. leading the seminar that I went to. Absolutely. The other day. Yeah. Absolutely. Let so me ask you, you John. Talk. Oh sure, and if you got it, and we're talking about it now, I think it's probably it's probably more ammo for you to keep it going. So follow your bliss in that case instead of embracing the abyss. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And now I can I can help people embrace their 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 abyss. So let me, let me ask you this, John, because I am, or I have been a one of those extreme sports guys, like loving the adrenaline. And it was always chasing this adrenaline where you felt like you're alive. Like uh, Eckhart Tolle talks about living in the now and being present. And you had gone through uh, Vietnam, right? And then you have gone through the savings and loans crisis. Well, both of those were embracing the abyss where you had to be alive. You had to think in the present moment. 
are you done embracing the abyss, or do you think that there is a new challenge that awaits you? Boy, um, I know that whenever the Vernon Savings thing was going on, I used to say, well, there's two things that they can't do to me. One, they can't eat me, and two, they can't send me back to Nam. <laughs> um, now I look at, yeah, and, you know, that that may very well come. It may very well come. Uh, I don't know. I, I think I've done my chosen part already. And I think my part now, and that's the part that I, of my pack, of the pact that Steve and I had, I think that's part of my pact, my, what, I'm, what I'm supposed to do, uh, is to uh, find a way to share what I've learned and with others so that they can accomplish basically what I've accomplished and what that is is righting the wrong, get right with yourself, and that way you get you have courage, have to have it, and I learned that when you have courage, you've got to share it, and hope, and uh, the other is you have to have a belief in yourself. So yes, I have a belief in myself. I think I could do it again, whatever came to me, but now I'm focusing on how many times I can recreate these thoughts and feelings about what people are struggling with to help them get through what they're getting through. Maybe it's wrongly convicted. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's just the general losers. But then, you know, why not have an embracing your abyss for winners as well? Now, the thing I love about 2018 is that the lines continue to get blurred. And so as you were talking, I'm trying to imagine an environment where uh, a, traffic, a classically trained accountant and a classically trained attorney are talking about divine agreements and reincarnation and, and past lives. What, what type of feedback have you gotten over the years regarding those subject matters? I've had uh, different feedback depending upon um, I guess the, the the person's upbringing. I looked at the possibility of trying to uh, make it um, ubiquitous for the world, but that's not going to sit well with certain religious groups. Uh, more than more than half of the world, with their beliefs, um, believe in. In reincarnation or incarnation and uh, I don't think that uh, is those I've, I've talked with about that because at one point in my life I didn't believe it and you know I um, I was just blown away when when I discovered it you know I didn't I didn't know all this was going on um, I know that when Steve died he, he died first from, almost died because he had a heart heart failure. And after a year, he got a transplant. And then four months later, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So it was, it's that kind of metaphysical life or thinking that allowed me, because I've been studying it for about 20 years, that allowed me to think that and know that, you know, when you're finished with your mission, that you came here to do, then you know you go, you go, you you've earned the right to go up, to go on, and that's how I viewed it, and I'm hoping that more people will view it, um, but it all depends on, you know, where they where they go on Sundays or Fridays or Saturdays, and and what they listen to. How are you able to determine that he was a a, a judge in a previous life? He, uh, one of our meetings towards the uh, towards the end, after after we could see that the the way had been cleared, that there weren't going to be any more problems for me, that the judge had granted me a release from probation after just two years, and he publicly thanked me for what I had done in the investigations and prosecutions. So. Um, it was it was something that he said one day to me at lunch. He said, "You know," he said, "I just had a past life regression," and I said, "Really? Tell me about it. Tell me about it." And of course, we were finishing up. We were 
both had to be places. So I didn't learn about it until probably a lot later on than I should have. But that's when I learned. That's what he told me. He would had his own past life regression. And then the other part in terms of the of the pack that came that came to me through via a medium, and I assume uh, most of the world or probably a lot of your listening office knows what what mediums are or what they do. And I sat one day at a holistic event. I kind of like to go to those things and and, and get a neck rub and. And, uh, you know, uh, or a foot rub <laughs> and uh, get, get, get a card reading or something. And I sat down in front of and because I asked those people, who in here are the best psychics? Who in here are the best mediums? So they gave me a name and I went over and I put my name on his list and I went over to get another uh, head rub. And uh, uh, my phone started ringing and I answered it. He said, are you John Smith? I said, yes. And he said, can you come over here and start? I said, no, I've got, I got to finish this, this foot rub I've got coming up next. And he said, all right, hurry up as soon as you can. So after I got all that done and went over there, and this guy's full all day long. And he, uh, I sat down in front of him, and he said, are you John Smith? I said, yes. And he said, do you know somebody named Steve? I said, yes. He said, well, he's been bothering me all morning. He said, <laughs> he said he's been pestering me all morning. And it was Steve. And I didn't, at first I was, you know, I was like, what? What are you talking about? How's, how's this possible? And then he starts, and then Steve takes over. And Steve starts talking through this guy. And it was just, you know, blew me away. And, and some of the, some of the, one of the chapters, or maybe two of the chapters towards the back of the book, those are conversations I had with Steve. That's him talking. Mm. And, and it was just Unbelievable. I mean, it's it's not unbelievable. It's believable. Now, (laughs) at one point in my life, that would have been, could can't don't believe that, don't listen to that. But this was, I was just, you know, convinced, totally convinced from what the guy said. How could this guy know all this stuff? You know, the guy I'm sitting in front of, the medium. It wasn't the medium. It was Steve on the other side. So, John, recognizing through this experience that, you you mentioned the word, you know, having a pact with Steve and you know, Hamza and myself, through our backgrounds, we're very familiar with that. We call them contracts. So did it make you start to look back in your lifetime and realize, hey, you know, I don't just have contracts with or pacts with just Steve. You know, I've probably had pacts with many, you know, most people or many people in my lifetime. Did you start looking back at, you know, different packs you might have had with, you know, family, friends, whoever, and just wondering what those were? Well, I uh, I felt like that, and there was a, a chapter in my book where I describe the, the room with no walls. It was a cloudy existence, smoky, and that was just a cloud, and that's where people chose their parents uh, if they were going to then – uh, you know, reincarnate. They they chose their um, brothers and sisters, uh, and all this it, it reminded me, or I guess it allowed me to view that in another stamp from another standpoint I'd never thought of before. That all this has been selected for the purpose of me getting to you know coming to Earth to to try to you know learn my lessons. Or, karmic lessons uh, for me to do that. Now, one, one thing, I, I, when I call it a, it was the divine agreement that the, um, you know, I was born in Dallas on September 15th, and Steve was born a week later in, in, uh, in Nashville. Uh, so that, that kind of gave me a, you know, a buzz as well when I, when I put that, that together. But it, 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 I think more importantly that I find not just my siblings or my parents that I will come into contact with someone and I'll kind of get a feeling about, you know, I know this person from somewhere. And a lot of times I'll I'll probably through meditation the following day that I'll think to myself, 
you know, that could have been some somebody coming from a from a previous lifetime, somebody I knew back when. So I, I often look for that now, or I'm aware of that now, because it can be good and it can be bad. Just have to be on your guard about what you're dealing with. Are you familiar with the author Michael Newton? His last name Newton? Yes. No, I'm not. So with, uh, I think it came out in the 90s. Well, anyway, he had written the book Journey of Souls, and you can do a YouTube search, and they have a lot of his audios and stuff on there. So most people are enamored by, oh, yeah, I was, you know, an Egyptian king or what have you. And with the Journey of Souls, it's more of a uh, life between lives. So you can do a regression and find out before you incarnated what were the, what are the lessons you're supposed to learn and so on and so forth. Because it, it could, I mean, you can, however you interpret the information, is is germane to you, but it seems that when you, if you could look at it that way from that approach, you may get more from it than, oh, in, this, in our previous lives, this is what we were. Because uh, there, there can be some overlapping themes that you continue to go through, but if you're embracing the abyss, it'll kind of show you or how you prepared for your current incarnation. Exactly. And uh, I intend to hopefully describe that in a manner that others will feel like they can help themselves uh, in whatever uh, you know, potholes are in their road or, or barriers put in front of them, that they'll be able to overcome those, but first they have to overcome those within themselves. And, and that's where I found my, my strength um, in, in dealing with that and in, in, in in anything that comes to me in the future, I mean, it certainly may alarm me. It certainly may may cause me to uh, to I guess become angry, possibly. But um, pre- preparation, I think, is is the word I'm seeking here, and, and I think that I can help others prepare for what they're dealing with and and how they can you know be happier about it. I used to think when I would do speaking that I wish I had something that I had in my pocket that I could give to people to put in their pocket. And that way it would help them lead a different life or a better life. They would enjoy life more. And I'm hoping that this message about uh, putting something in your pocket can come from embracing your abyss for those that are filling the blank. Absolutely. I'm thinking with the Internet, there's so many groups for everything. If you like surfing, if you like badminton, and I'm sure there's some CPAs that are going along their lives and they think everything is fine and are unaware of any upheaval or any signs to look for. So, I mean, you've been through the trenches. You've embraced the abyss. So you're definitely a beacon. Yeah. Well, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's that's now the coal in my engine. Um, as I'm as I'm getting on another train, and I hope it lasts for a long time. It's cold, John. It's not green energy. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm not bothered by that, but some are. Uh, I'll just have to find something green then for the for those that demand that for the lo- for, the, for the locomotive. You know, they have a little green locomotive, and I'm the one to do it. You know, it all it all boils down to. To, to courage and belief in yourself. Remember the thing that was, uh, I, I think I can, I think I can, and then getting to the top and going down the other side, I knew I could, I knew I could. You know, the little engine, they could, yeah. sure, sure. And it's comforting that you did get through it because the people that are going through it right now, they may not see it, they won't see an end in sight. And so you're definitely proof that this is tra- it's transitional. Just like everything else, it's not long-lasting, and if you stay with the wherewithal, you can get through it. Right, right, <clears throat> right. So where can people pick up the Embracing the Abyss, and where could they get in touch with you with, if they'd like to get you for a speaking engagement or learn more about you? Well, the book is, um, uh, this book is, is on Amazon, uh, Embracing the Abyss. I um, uh, will certainly 
market as best I can. The, the upcoming stuff I'm getting ready to write. Uh, my my speaking, of course. Uh, I just got back from Philadelphia for um, a four-day visit, and on one of those days, I was given the opportunity to speak about about my book and about the abyss, and that went very very well. Um, uh, email would be a good way to get in touch with me. Would be uh, John, my name John at embracingtheabyss.com would be the best way to get in touch with me. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, you have just been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. And John, thanks for sharing Embracing the Abyss with us. Please stay in touch with us with your future endeavors. I will. It's been my pleasure, guys. Yes, thanks for being with All right. Thanks again for checking out another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast. Please check us out on our website at intrinsicmotivation.life where you can click on the speak pipe button and leave any suggestions for a future podcast that you'd like us to cover. Also check us out on our social media sites. We have a YouTube channel, Facebook page, iTunes podcast, in addition to Stitcher and Google Play, all under Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. Check you out next time. Have a great day.